Hello, my name is Jeremy, and this is the True Crime Chronicles channel. Upon entering matrimony, each woman envisions a radiant future filled with joyous family moments. Wendy was no exception, filled with immense joy. Yet, her idyllic union was tragically cut short after just four days, as Wendy was savagely taken from this life. Her face left completely marred. In marrying the man she believed to be her dream partner, Wendy had, without realizing, taken a step toward her own demise. This narrative unfolds in Miami, Florida. Renowned as a hub of festivities with its year-round splendid weather and numerous attractive locales, including South Beach, a paradise for those who revel in the nightlife with its myriad of hotels, eateries, and bars along the shoreline. Yolanda Chirillo resided slightly removed from Miami's vibrant heart, embracing a tranquil lifestyle far removed from the hustle and bustle. The young 28-year-old single mother dedicated herself to raising her daughter, striving to be an exemplary parent. Having turned her back on the party scene, Yolanda was poised to embrace stability, seek a spouse, and prioritize her family. She was in a relationship with Michelle Escoto, a man noted for his height, charm, impeccable grooming, and handsomeness. Their relationship, initially platonic and harmonious, gradually blossomed into romance. Yolanda and Michelle's paths crossed at a computer technology school, where they were stark contrasts. She, a serene and grounded individual. He, an adventurous romantic and the soul of any gathering, always in pursuit of excitement. Yet, as the saying goes, opposites attract. By the age of 30, Michelle was earnest about laying down roots. The duo had cohabited for roughly a year, during which Escoto became a father figure to Cerillo's child. All seemed well, except for one of Michel's aspirations. He harbored ambitions of carving out a successful career and launching his own venture. Yolanda was wholly supportive, understanding that his success would ensure a stable future for her and her daughter. She harbored hopes of marrying Michel, thereby solidifying their union into a complete family unit. Her aspirations mirrored a fairy tale romance, envisioning a chivalrous rescuer who would whisk her away to a resplendent castle. Michelle, having already surpassed any of her previous partners in his contributions to her life, vowed to provide the dream life they both coveted once his financial aspirations were realized, immediately setting his sights on identifying the most lucrative industries to venture into. In Miami's landscape, teeming with affluent and attractive individuals, there emerged a palpable need for beauty parlors, spa facilities, aesthetic clinics, and surgical centers. Michelle, mulling over this demand and his own aptitudes, chose to delve into the realm of cosmetology. With a foundational knowledge in hairdressing under his belt, he aimed to grasp the business intricacies required to launch his salon, envisioned as a welcoming space for all. Michel discovered a school named Label in proximity, and enrolled in courses set to commence in February 2002. Within the beauty school's milieu, Escoto, as one of the rare men with traditional orientations, found himself amidst young, driven women who lavished him with attention. A natural charmer, he easily dispensed flattery, enhancing his popularity among the female students. This experience harkened back to his younger days, replete with allurements. Despite his commitment to Yolanda, Michelle encountered a formidable temptation in Wendy Trapaga, a stunning 21-year-old woman. Unbeknownst to his partner, he was prone to flirtation and often engaged in inappropriate conduct in the company of beautiful women. Escoto returned to Yolanda each night, maintaining the facade of a conventional family life. Yet, the more time he spent with Wendy, the more Michelle's resolve waned. Wendy stood out from the other women Michelle had met previously. She exuded sweetness, charm, and boasted a model's physique without an ounce of pretense. Raised with values of modesty and compassion, Wendy Marie Trapaga entered the world on April 29, 1981, the daughter of Miriam and Ernest. Her parents, having met in Miami and bridging a significant age gap with Miriam 21 years Ernest's junior, fell deeply in love, married, and welcomed Wendy into their lives a few years thereafter. She epitomized the term, Daddy's Girl. Ernest cherished his little girl, ensuring she was nurtured in an environment filled with love and respect. As a cargo plane pilot, Ernest's career demanded frequent travel, leaving Wendy in anticipation of his return from each journey. She was overjoyed whenever her father arrived home, always with a present in hand for his beloved daughter. March 31, 1988. 
marked an unforgettable moment in the life of 16-year-old Wendy. Her father's aircraft ignited at an elevation of 150 feet above the ground, plummeting into a barren zone adjacent to the airstrip. This tragedy took the lives of all passengers aboard. The profound sorrow Wendy experienced that day lingered with her for life. Ernest was 61 at his time of passing, leaving Miriam in profound grief. Transitioning to a widow, she poured her heart into supporting her family. Securing a position as a school administrative assistant, she diligently worked her way up to oversee the extracurricular programs at a Miami-Dade County primary school. Eventually, Miriam found love once more and wed Juan Benitez. Wendy gained step-siblings who warmly embraced the reserved girl, providing her with the much-needed affection missing since her father's demise. During her adolescent years, Wendy discovered a fervent interest in aesthetics and couture. She was the epitome of grace, with her deep brown eyes, lengthy locks, and radiant grin. Her presence commanded attention, yet Wendy remained humble. Her humility and kindness drew even greater admiration from those around her. Upon completion of her studies, Wendy entered into marriage, which soon fell apart, prompting her to emulate her two relatives who ran beauty parlors. Consequently, she enrolled in the label's Beauty Academy in Miami, concurrently with Michelle Escado. Wendy found herself instantly drawn to the gentleman. His allure, flattering remarks, and consistent ability to bring a smile to her face captivated her. Michelle identifies as an executive in web design, holding a technology degree. Possibly, Wendy's early loss of her father led her to instinctively gravitate towards older males, viewing them as a source of security. Michelle neglected to mention to Wendy that he was already in a relationship with someone else. Instead, he dedicated more of his time to this new acquaintance, displaying a profound emotional connection and seeking her favor. Their friendship deepened, leading to them spending considerable time together, while Yolanda believed her boyfriend was diligently focusing on his career aspirations. The bond between Wendy and Michelle smoothly transitioned from emotional to physical, showcasing undeniable chemistry. They were inseparable, reminiscent of infatuated teenagers. As Yolanda patiently awaited his return at home, Wendy was open to exploring all forms of intimacy to fulfill his desires and enhance their pleasure. Yolanda was perplexed by the changes in their relationship. Having been together for more than two years, she was unaware that Escoto frequently engaged with other women, one of whom had even financed his education in beauty school. Initially, Michelle regarded Wendy merely as another notch on his belt. However, as time passed, his feelings for her deepened. He appreciated that she didn't pressure him for commitment, didn't urge him towards marriage, and didn't impose her will on him. Yet, they kept their relationship a secret from their peers at the Beauty Academy, a situation Wendy couldn't fathom, especially since they had been an item for two months. Yolanda sensed a shift in their dynamic as well. Michelle grew more aloof, and their relationship began to resemble that of flatmates more than lovers. He stopped discussing his aspirations, ceased sharing details of his daily life, and largely neglected Yolanda. This prompted her to question his whereabouts and the lack of communication, which only served to drive him further away. Eventually, Michelle resolved to end their relationship, driven by his feelings for Wendy. In August 2002, he instigated an argument, expressed his grievances, packed his belongings, and departed. Yolanda was left in disbelief. She had envisioned a future with him, and yet he left without offering any justification. She sought to understand her shortcomings and the reason behind his departure. Persistent calls went unanswered by Michelle. Ultimately, Yolanda deciphered the password to his voicemail, uncovering messages that revealed he had moved in with another woman named Wendy. Yolanda was stunned to learn that in the short span following their split, Michelle had swiftly moved on with Wendy. They had found a modest apartment in a secluded part of Miami, where they began their life together, filled with dreams and contentment. The sole objector to their cohabitation was Wendy's mother, Miriam, who deemed Michelle entirely inappropriate for her daughter, due to his being nearly a decade, her senior and jobless to boot. Miriam was baffled by how they managed to sustain themselves in their humble abode, suspecting that they were hastening their relationship. She was taken aback to find out their home was unfurnished, and they resorted to sleeping on the floor. Nonetheless, Miriam's primary concern was her daughter's happiness. She resolved not to meddle if Michelle was the key to Wendy's joy. 
Her hope was for them to forge a successful life and career together in the beauty industry, eventually marrying and starting a family. Yet, it became apparent to the rest of the family that Wendy was pinching pennies wherever possible. Whereas Michelle had a tendency to frivolously spend money despite having no visible means of employment. Wendy, unaware of the source of his finances, likely believed Michelle was making money through his tech skills. The thought that he might be involved with other women never crossed her mind, showcasing her innocent trust. Barely three months into their cohabitation, the couple's announcement of their impending marriage took everyone by surprise. Miriam, who had previously restrained her objections, found it impossible to stay silent this time. She was convinced that her daughter was making a hasty decision, especially considering their financial instability and lack of employment, which made even the prospect of a modest wedding seem impractical. Despite her deep love and desire to support her daughter, Miriam's disapproval was palpable. She was concerned about the precipitous nature of the decision and skeptical of her daughter's choice in partner. Nonetheless, determined to proceed, the couple planned to formalize their union at the City Hall in October 2002, opting for a simple legal process devoid of any elaborate celebration. When Miriam asked Wendy for an explanation at such a rapid pace, Wendy revealed a good reason that shocked her mother. She was pregnant. Because of their belief that children should be conceived within the marriage bond, they decided to marry. On October 10, 2002, Michelle and Wendy exchanged vows at the Miami Beach City Hall marking their union without the fanfare of an extravagant celebration. However, the couple harbored aspirations for a modest honeymoon and set their sights on an enchanting destination not far from home, Key West, Florida. This locale, celebrated for its quaint pastel-colored homes, superb scuba diving opportunities, and the iconic 11-kilometer stretch of bridge traversing the sea, represented the ideal backdrop for their post-wedding getaway. Located at the southernmost tip of the United States, Key West promised a romantic retreat just a three to four hour drive from Miami. Eager to commence their adventure, Michelle and Wendy departed on Friday, October 11th, planning to bask in their newlywed bliss over the weekend and return by Sunday evening. Their two-day escapade in Key West was filled with joyous moments shared between husband and wife. Yet, upon their return to Miami on Sunday, the couple found themselves reluctant to conclude their brief holiday. In a gesture of continued celebration, Michelle secured a lavish room in a prestigious hotel renowned for its amorous ambiance. Wendy, delighted by the unexpected extension of their honeymoon, informed her mother of their decision to prolong their stay. The surprise arrangement by her husband filled her with excitement. They envisioned a romantic evening that included dining out, possibly catching a movie, or dancing the night away at a nightclub. Despite harboring concerns for Wendy's well-being due to her pregnancy, Miriam's overarching sentiment was one of happiness for her daughter's joy. Close to midnight, the newly married couple arrived at the hotel and dedicated the following hours to delight in one another's company within their room. Wendy was content, yet unbeknownst to her, it would be her final night in this world. At around 5.30 a.m. on Monday, a phone call abruptly woke Miriam. A glance at the clock sent a chill through her, as a sense of foreboding immediately took hold. In the brief moment before answering the phone, her mind was flooded with anxious thoughts, predominantly about Wendy. Uncertain of what such an early call might entail, she picked up the receiver with trepidation. The voice on the other line was familiar, yet not her daughter's. It was Michelle, Wendy's husband, who confusingly asked if Wendy was with her. Michelle recounted how they had been out drinking the previous night and Wendy had wanted to keep the night going, despite his concerns for their unborn child. This led to their first argument, which happened in the car on their way back. He entered their apartment alone, leaving Wendy outside. When he checked on her after 5-10 minutes, she had disappeared. His attempts to reach her by phone were unsuccessful. Following a conversation with Michelle, agreeing to give Wendy some space, Miriam couldn't help but worry about where her pregnant daughter could be so early in the day. She tried not to panic, yet she knew it was unlike Wendy to act this way. When Miriam met Michelle at the school where she worked, she encountered a man visibly shaken, obviously distressed, and at a loss for what to do next. They were soon to discover Wendy's fate, a truth they would undoubtedly wish remained unknown. As the unfolding reality was more harrowing than they could have ever anticipated. 
At 6 a.m., a sanitation worker on his regular route through a commercial warehouse district in the northwest area of Dade contacted the Miami-Dade police after spotting something unusual in a parking lot nestled between two vehicles. Drawing nearer, he stumbled upon the lifeless form of a woman donned in a blue evening dress, prone and surrounded by a pool of blood, with blood splatters visible on an adjacent car, signifying that the violent act had occurred right there in the lot. Forensic specialists, upon their arrival, were taken aback. The subsequent examination of the woman revealed a disfigured body, battered beyond recognition, indicating she had been subjected to repeated blows with a heavy object, though no potential weapons were located on site. The deceased was swiftly identified as Wendy Trapaga, thanks to her driver's license and a purse containing additional identification items found by her side. Mere hours before this tragic discovery, she had been a vibrant, newlywed young woman, expectant with her first child. Upon receiving the devastating news of her daughter's demise, Miriam was engulfed in an abyss of sorrow, her tears unceasing. This woman, already bereaved by the loss of her husband, now faced the abrupt and unfathomable loss of her daughter. Amidst the detective's efforts to ascertain the young woman's identity, Miriam was approached by a call from Michelle, inquiring about any updates on Wendy. At a loss for words, Miriam struggled with how to convey to the groom that his bride was no longer alive. A detective intervened, taking over the call to inform Michelle that they would visit his residence to discuss the matter in detail. The grim revelation about Wendy, his wife of merely four days, left Michelle utterly dumbfounded, robbing him of the ability to speak. Allowing him a moment to process the shock, the police later escorted Escoto to the station, seeking to compile further details about the life and untimely death of his wife. During a grueling 14-hour interrogation, Michelle recounted the events of the evening leading up to Wendy's tragic demise. The couple had left their hotel and were driving home around 3 a.m. when a disagreement over alcohol consumption intensified. During the argument, Wendy startlingly admitted that she was not actually pregnant, further fueling the dispute. Being near their apartment, Michelle decided to go inside, leaving Wendy in the car to allow both some time to cool down. That was the last time he saw Wendy. Days later, the autopsy report revealed harrowing details. Wendy had suffered 15 to 20 severe wounds to her face and neck from being struck repeatedly with a blunt object, which left her face unrecognizable. Additionally, signs of strangulation were evident, indicating an attempt to cut off her air supply. Investigators also found foreign DNA on Wendy's dress. The toxicology results showed the presence of alcohol and a sedative in Wendy's system, with her estimated time of death pinpointed between 3 and 5 a.m. on October 14th. Curiously, although she was found without shoes, her feet were clean, which, along with the absence of defensive wounds on her hands and legs, suggested she might not have attempted to defend herself or could have been unconscious or restrained during the attack. The medical examiner confirmed Wendy was not pregnant at the time of her death, leaving the reason behind her falsehood as one of the many mysteries surrounding the case. As Wendy's loved ones grieved for her, the authorities uncovered a fresh clue through Michelle's call logs. He had dialed a number at 3.15 a.m. on the day his wife passed away. The detectives followed this lead and learned the call was placed to Michelle's former girlfriend, Yolanda, who was promptly taken in for interrogation. When informed of Wendy's demise, Cerulia shared her history with Michelle with the officers. She harbored deep affection for him and was heartbroken over his abrupt exit. Despite her attempts to reach him, he remained unresponsive until the autumn of 2002, when, a few months after his departure, he answered her call. Michelle admitted to being involved with another woman, yet insisted his feelings for Wendy were non-existent and he yearned for Yolanda, hoping for a reunion. The woman, eager to welcome Michelle back, trusted him once more. With hopes of reigniting their romance, they resumed their communication and even met up again. Escado maintained his pattern of leading a dual existence. The probe reached an impasse. The investigators were without solid proof. Lacking DNA, fingerprints, video surveillance, or even a murder weapon, the evidence was insubstantial. Roughly two months following Wendy's passing, Escoto once again captured the attention of the investigators, positioning himself as the leading suspect. He sought to collect funds from a life insurance policy. It was unveiled that the couple had insured themselves for a million dollars, designating each other as the beneficiary of the policy. Detectives speculated that Michelle might have had a million motives for desiring the demise of his young spouse and proceeded to investigate further. 
Escado harbored far more secrets than expected, including a history of criminal activity. In the past, he had been apprehended and accused of armed robbery. Michelle had entered a drugstore, attempted to empty the cash register, and also tried to pilfer prescription drugs. Moreover, he faced charges for hiding a weapon. Three years subsequent to Wendy's passing, the inquiry was still active. The prosecutors felt they possessed sufficient circumstantial evidence to apprehend Michelle and formally accuse him. The detectives opted to interrogate Yolanda once more, suspecting she had more information than she had previously disclosed. Following Wendy's demise, the pair reunited and cohabited, yet their shared existence was far from joyful. When Yolanda was summoned for questioning, law enforcement officials confronted her with evidence that she had financed the newlyweds' stay at a luxurious hotel in Miami. By warning Yolanda of the potential repercussions for making false declarations, the police pressured her into revealing the truth. In the autumn, as the former couple rekindled their affair, Michelle claimed he was obligated to marry Wendy due to her pregnancy, despite his indifference towards her and his scheme to eliminate her if it meant securing the million-dollar insurance payout. Their ultimate scheme was to amass wealth together with Yolanda, enabling them to live lavishly. Blinded by her affection for Escoto, Yolanda was indifferent to the fate of her adversary. Her only concern was for Escoto to rejoin her. Justice for Wendy Trapaga was delivered 12 years posthumously. Yolanda Cirillo received complete immunity for her testimony against Michelle Escoto. She admitted to not only being cognizant of the felonious plans, but also to aiding in their formulation. After their initial failed attempts to eliminate Wendy during a holiday, Michelle resolved to take decisive action. He laced his young wife's beverage with sedatives in their hotel suite. As she started to become drowsy, he transported her outside and situated her in the vehicle. In the dead of night, he arrived at Yolanda's residence, requesting his paramour to tail him in her vehicle. Subsequently, he proceeded to an isolated parking area in the northwest sector of Dade, where he instructed Chirilio to leave temporarily while he attended to Wendy. Following the agreed duration, Yolanda witnessed her paramour returning to her vehicle, smeared in blood and clutching a crowbar. Afterwards, they headed to Biscayne Bay, where Michel discarded the murder tool and cleansed himself of the crime's traces. Yolanda then drove the man back to the domicile he shared with the woman he had just slain with a crowbar. Cirilio managed his bloodied attire by discarding it in a trash receptacle. The testimony provided by the crime's alleged accomplice might have been subject to skepticism. It's conceivable that Yolanda could have played a more direct part in the murder of her adversary, given that Michelle might have opted to suffocate the young woman, avoiding any bloodshed. It is the scorned lover who might have been responsible for brutally disfiguring Wendy, stripping her of her beauty. Regrettably, the truth of the matter is likely to remain undisclosed, as Yolanda's immunity agreement shields her from arrest or prosecution. This aspect was leveraged by Escoto's defense, who attempted to cast the entirety of the culpability onto his client's forsaken lover. Nevertheless, it only took the jury two and a half hours to convict Michelle Escoto of first-degree murder handing down a sentence of life imprisonment without the chance for parole. While Wendy's family finally saw some form of justice after years of waiting, their satisfaction was incomplete, knowing that Yolanda Cirillo, the woman who might have averted their daughter's tragic end, would continue to walk free. If you like this story, subscribe to the channel so you don't miss new videos. Don't forget to like and share your opinion in the comments. This is Jeremy. See you in the next video.